Okay, well, it's 10. Let's go ahead and start. Welcome. This is ORI's FPGA meetup where we talk about what we have done and what we plan to do. And um, if we have any roadblocks, anything that's preventing us from, from doing what we uh, aim to do, and uh, if we need any resources. Uh, so go ahead, Paul, tell us how things are going in remote labs. Okay, well, I've got a slightly less boring report than usual. We did have some some fun with hardware this week. I got a, a note from Ken six days ago on Wednesday. He couldn't log in with SSH to the Choco Cat VM. So I approached this as a networking problem because it's always a networking problem. And I went to see if I could SSH into it, and I couldn't either. Um, hmm. Okay, so luckily I had a Choco Cat VM window already open on on my Mac here, and I was able to interact with that still, even though I couldn't make a fresh login, I could still use the old login. And an amazing number of things were just not working at all. I couldn't even see what processes were running on the system. I could interact with it. I, I could type back and forth and get command responses that made sense, and some commands worked. I could do disk directories, but I couldn't do a process status or half a dozen other things. So it was, it was in sorry shape um i figured out well a lot of the errors if i try to do a ps for instance what i'd get was a disk io error and that mean usually means a real hardware error um so i tracked down the uh, the error a little bit i was able to bring up the self-diagnosis on the disk that was applicable that the one that runs the vm chaco cat uh, these disks modern disks these days have a, a feature called smart which is a, a rather strange backronym which stands for self-monitoring analysis and reporting technology um, so if you can talk to the little controller on on the drive then you can get some information about what it thinks its health status is and I was able to do that remarkably enough, and it uh, dumped out a bunch of information that all looked like it was per perfectly happy, except for one little line there that said that it had completely run out of spare sectors. Uh, on a SSD, there's usually spare sectors provision so that when one sector wears out, it can uh, substitute a spare. And uh, disks of this class have about 10% uh, spares or some number like that. And they were all gone. Uh, and when it when that happens, the disk goes into a read-only mode. Uh, to, I guess that's better than just going offline. <laughs> so uh, I was getting this behaviors I was getting were not entirely consistent with just read-only mode. Uh, other things probably got confused within the Linux when it couldn't write stuff to disks. Um, but that was enough of a clue. I was able to determine that the that the SSD was was an actually actual hardware failure. So uh, pour one out for this little guy. It's a two terabyte uh, SSD NVMe. Uh, this is still a current uh, current product. This is uh, still pretty much one of the fastest ones, good ones out there. They're a little bit cheaper now than they were when we bought them for the remote lab. Um, so the next step was to get a replacement drive on order. So I ordered one, same kind. Um, and then to try to recover the data. So the first thing I learned, much to my chagrin, was that the uh, the backups that were supposed to be running on the uh, on the VMs were not working. Uh, so I had nothing even vaguely resembling a current backup for Chaco Cat. And uh, this is bad. <laughs> Uh, really should have current backups and you should be testing them periodically to make sure that they really work. And I had not been doing that. So I was not aware that the, uh, the backups were not working. So we could have just started from scratch, uh, built a fresh VM and uh, put all the stuff that we needed back on it. Um, it wouldn't have been as horrible as it sounds because a lot of the big tool installs are actually on a separate volume, which is still working fine. Um, this would just be user directories and stuff. Unfortunately, that includes all the places where we've done our own work. And uh, not all of that work is in repos. Uh, if it had all been in repos, then we could have just checked it all back out and 
you know, gotten back up fairly quickly, but the repos are snapshots of things that are deemed worthy of checking in. And there's lots of reasons why something might not be in, in the repo. It might be too big. It might be uh, too transient. Anyway, we'd lose work. Um, so I wanted to see if I could recover as much data as possible from the, uh, from the existing drive. And if it's in read only mode, right, it should be no problem. I'll just read it out. I'll have an image and then I can, you know, I can use that. And that didn't work uh, in the most straightforward way anyway, because it was still getting these IO errors whenever it tried to read one of the bad sectors. Um, and turned out there were quite a few bad sectors, uh, like 7,000 of them. That's what I've ended up deciding. Um, so I used a, a recovery utility that understands that there might be bad sectors on the disk and might need to read around them and, and recover if there's an error instead of just exiting the, the program. Uh, there are several such things, including some that are built into the OS. So I used to use the um, DD Rescue, I think is what it's called. Um, that does exactly that. And I ran that and it took 24 hours to run uh, on a two terabyte drive. Uh, it's going through doing relatively small IOs and it's really designed for a spinning disk, which is expected to fail in certain mechanical ways. And with that kind of a failure, uh, you don't really want to read the bad sector over and over again. Uh, you don't want to read it too intensively in the general vicinity of the bad sector because it might be a real me mechanical problem. So you want to jump away and read somewhere else. So there's, there's all this strategy involved, none of which is applicable at all to an SSD, uh, but it probably slowed the system down for, for recovery. Anyway, uh, after a couple of passes of this operation, the percentage recovered was showing at 99.99% .99 which sounds pretty darn good. Um, on a two terabyte disk though, 99.99% is still like 30 megabytes of, da of data that's been destroyed. Um, and I don't know where it is. Uh, let me back up a little and describe the storage on the system in general. This Unraid system is uh, intended for all sorts of different applications that involve may involve multiple VMs, multiple Docker containers, uh, all sorts of different things that may require different kinds of storage. But the core of it all is uh, an unraid array. So the large chunk of storage on this system is spinning disks, in our case, uh, four of them, uh, in a raid array, uh, but it's a special kind of raid array, an unraid array. Um, but the result is that uh, different virtual disks can be allocated on this uh, on this large array and uh, and used for whatever purposes. And that's how we started out configuring the whole system. We had these four spinning disks and two SSDs of the type that I showed you, the NVMe uh, SSDs, as cache to speed up the, the array. And as it turned out, this was not a great solution for the kind of work we're doing. Uh, it had been spec'd out based on the need for large files of streaming samples, and it would have been great for that. Um, but we're using it as development stations, basically. The, these VMs are general purpose uh, machines that are doing lots and lots of heavy compute when we run something like Vivado or MATLAB, and they're slow uh, for that kind of operation. So we had added uh, two more SSDs of that type, specifically for the purpose of speeding up uh, operation in the VMs. Uh, one SSD is allocated to be the root disk for all for VMs, and all of them are on that disk, the one that failed. And the other one is used to, to speed up access to tools like Vivado. So all those big installs of tools are on that SSD. Now, these individual SSDs that are added are not part of the array, they're, so they're not protected by parity. So there's no intrinsic error protection on these things in, the, in our architecture now. There would have been if we had stuck with the, the main unraid array, but 
in the in the configuration we ended up with for speed purposes uh, no and as it turns out it's not that fast even with an ssd for that kind of storage so uh, we're looking at uh, possible architecture changes that'll that'll either speed that up or make it more reliable or preferably both um anyway the recovery uh, program did manage to retrieve 99.99% of the of the sectors successfully. So I took that to be good enough to, to try to move forward with. And I made a couple of backup copies of that on different drives, which took a long time because moving two terabytes from one drive to another takes a while. And then I had to wipe the, the replacement drive again and put just the, the good copies, the 99.99% good copies, uh, onto the drive where they would have been before and started up and the, the VMs work, uh, as Ken alluded to in his presentation, uh, he has loaded up a couple of his big designs and they seem to be intact, uh, so far. Uh, that doesn't mean that there are no errors on these disks. There's still 30 megabytes of something somewhere that's been destroyed, wiped out with zeros. Hopefully none of our hand stick hand crafted painstakingly created code, but maybe some of it we'll, we'll know. And when we run across it, uh, there's no good way to go search it out. So people who have been using the machines, Michelle and, and Matthew in particular, uh, have been using them lately and uh, a few other people will have to keep their eye out for, for mysterious failures. And if something just doesn't work, might be a directory that isn't there because the directory structure got stomped or it might be a file that has a big chunk missing out of the middle of it. Um, that'll be because of this. <laughs> and I apologize in advance for the extra work you'll have to do to, uh, to put it all back. Um, I don't know if we want to talk about the possible improvement paths here now or, or, or save that for another time. Oh, could we do a diff against the, um, the backup and see, because basically this this should flag anything between the backup and the... The trouble is we don't have a backup. I thought you had an older backup. Oh, well, but it's a lot older. <laughs> it's... Uh, I think the newest thing I could find was from 2022. Oh, okay. Moving okay. forward, we'll have fresher okay. backups, it sounds. Is it, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Okay. Um, I mean, even with that, you might find, you know, if you could do some checksums or something just to see if there's any, like, pattern. You know, maybe there's some clues to, like, what, what the actual missing or corrupted areas might be. I don't expect there will be any pattern to detect um, looking at the, the numbers as they flew by during the, the, the rescue attempt. It looks like the errors are scattered around, um, which is what you'd expect on a SSD that's been kept pretty busy and had lots of operations done on it. Um, Should we replace all of the drives? No, I don't think that's required at all. The, this is the only drive that's seen that kind of service. The, uh, the cache drives may fail, but they can fail without, they're, they're part of the array, the self-correcting array. We should find out in advance when they start to fail. Uh, actually, we should have found out about this one too. I don't understand why I didn't get notifications when the smart started to det detect errors. In particular, it was supposed to have notified me when it got down to 90% of uh, free uh, of spare sectors, but it didn't. Um, but this drive in particular, with no error correction available on it, has been hammered by all the work that all of us have done on all the VMs since we switched to that architecture. And uh, okay, so moving not, forward, like what, what? So what? What? What will be different with this one now that it, that we think it's back in service and we we do have to go? kind of check and and I'm relieved that um errors I can now blame on the <laughs> I'm so happy about this. Um, yeah, my so, fault. 
Um, <laughs> but like, so what, what will be is, different? Well, today the answer is nothing is different. I put it back the way it was. Uh, and we're still using that drive without any air protection and without any valid backup. So I got a couple of things to do. One is to establish work, backups that actually work. Uh, and that may mean uh, going off site with the backups because there's a lot of data to back up and it's changing a lot. Um, maybe a, an online backup service would be worth the money. Uh, or we could just get a couple of external drives that are huge and, and back up to them and do them, that maintenance ourselves. But anyway, some that's relatively routine. I'll set up something that uh, that actually backs up the, the VMs periodically, so we can't lose more than a few days or a few hours or whatever we decide is is crucial of of work. Um, the other problem that needs to be addressed, or we could take this opportunity to try to address, is the speed problem. The the VMs just are not as fast as they ought to be, and the only thing I can figure is that it's the the disk drives with the architecture the unrated architecture are just not as fast as they're supposed to be. Um, I would add additional dedicated drives if there were any more places in the machine to add drives, but it's pretty well stuffed full, except that I discovered in my research for this problem that the manufacturer of the motherboard also has a plug-in card that's designed to work with this motherboard and provides four additional NVMe slots, all with their own dedicated four lanes of, of PCIe bandwidth uh, and capable of operating independently or as a, as a RAID. Um, this motherboard is now several years old because it's been a while since we set up their remote labs. <clears throat> not a current product, but... And so the, the plug-in card for it also is not a current product, but I found one used and have it on order. Uh, if it wasn't a lot of money for the card, but we then have to fill it up with storage or at least add some storage to it. And if we go whole hog and do the best that we possibly can, get the later generation of this device and get them in the, the biggest available size, which is now four terabytes instead of two terabytes, um, we'd be spending like $1,500 on storage space. And then we'd have two possible architectures, well, more than two, but uh, two obvious possible architectures to experiment with. Um, one would be uh, to take all four of those and raid them up for speed. Um, and that's a supported configuration. Motherboard takes care of that. Um, then we'd have one, uh, if we went to the four terabyte drives, we'd have one 12 terabyte SSD that was blazing fast, faster for many operations anyway, than the one SSD as a bare metal device. And then we'd put virtual disks on that in the same way we have put virtual disks on the existing SSD. And that should give us a speed up. But we don't know. Supposedly the virtual disks have very little overhead, but that doesn't explain why they're slow. So maybe they have more overhead than they're supposed to have. And the way around that would be to dedicate a physical hardware device, each SSD that we dedicated directly to a VM. And the VM would write through with, with virtually no overhead and read through to that device. And that's gotta be as fast as, or nearly as fast as, as a bare metal hardware implementation, which ought to be faster than what we're seeing now. And then uh, maybe allocate one of those as a, um, as a backup. There's new software tricks with new file systems that we didn't have when we first installed Unraid that can stream backups between drives and all sorts of crazy stuff like that. Okay. That's exciting. So, um, figuring out a way, if, if we're willing to spend that money to, to speed up and increase the capabilities of the other remote lab VMs, then we have an option that you could also spend about half that much money and get about half that much storage. Uh, you could go to a quarter of that much storage, but that's not nearly another factor or two in money. So the only things that make sense are the two terabyte drives, like the ones we had, or four terabyte drives, which would double what we had before. Yeah. Well, we do have high volume projects. I mean, anything dealing with um, with FPGAs and and Vivado and Vitus and MATLAB and 
and images and pedal Linux, it, it can take up quite a bit of disk space. Uh, and we have had a couple of times where disks have gotten full. Um, so I'm kind of in favor of, of going for speed, uh, you know, whatever it takes to speed things up, I think would, 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 it would definitely reduce the, the loop where you make a change and you want to try it. And, um, like right now on the Pluto, making the, making some changes for, uh, for that Tuckle script to, to see if it'll make, uh, you know, all those, those interesting things that we, me and, and Matthew and Everest were working through. It's seven minutes and 31 seconds to get to the point where it was kind of regularly failing. And if that could be faster, um, which at one point when we, when we rolled out remote labs, it was very, very fast. So um, if we could get back to that with, with some reasonably solid backups, I think that would be amazing. And that would be the, the ideal case. So, but I'm saying like whatever uh, path forward that you think as a, as the remote lab manager uh, that will solve the problem, uh, go for it. So uh, Paul, there are different brands out there on the SSDs and Samsung, I don't know, is the, it's not, tip, it's more consumer focused, I think, in terms of like write durability. And I ended up getting a, um, for my build here, I, I got a, uh, I, I, I'd have to check, but I, I ended up steering away from Samsung. Okay. I I've looked at reviews and, and discussions of drives and I haven't seen anything that suggests these were more fragile than, than other drives. I mean, they, they do use sort of space optimizing technology rather than reliability optimizing technology, but we need the space. If we wanted to buy that much technology in uh, uh, the old fashioned single layer or two times uh, SSDs that are super reliable, We'd go broke. It'd be impossible. Yeah, there'd be no place. To I, I ended up buying the. Uh, it was Sa Sabrent or Sabrent uh, was the the brand. Do they actually are they actually manufacture? They just build the little boards. This that I don't. I have some Sabrent accessory stuff, but I never heard of them being a drive manufacturer. Yeah, they make a. That was one of their selling points was that they they had uh, more. Uh, the more rights i think compared to samsung is what i remember but i i could do some research on and, and give you give you some so it's been a couple of years since i've surveyed this but that i i remember i ended up or initially going with samsung and then i decided to give that to michael at, at one point um and went and bought a, a sabrent so yeah, a little bit of market research would be really helpful if you could give us a memo about it. I think that would that would help a lot. Yeah, I'm I'm not frankly not that concerned about the wear time. Um, we wore out if if it was just wear, and I don't know that it was because it wore out very suddenly. And I don't think that's a typical failure mode. I think we probably have a controller failure rather than wear out. But if this was wear out, then we got several good years out of it. Um, if we had valid backups and if we had a better monitoring so that we knew it was wearing out in advance like even not just a few days in advance would have helped um yeah then it would have been no big deal and it sounds like we're gonna well we're gonna have a backup solution moving we're gonna forward. absolutely gonna solve the backup problem. Okay. <laughs> and so I, the, I don't the know about the monitoring like the smart yeah. monitoring thing failed and and that's a little weird um you know, so it's really hard to test though. The smart yeah. one, it's going to say it's good until it doesn't. And uh, yeah, the I, the RAID that I use with the uh, Michelle's Mac Pro has a smart monitor built into it. It's a software based RAID, so it yeah, throws, a, to, to throws off really a flag get... anytime the smart uh, disk status gives it gives it errors. So. You ever had that happen? Yeah. Yeah. Because we had a bunch of bad Hitachi two terabyte drives initially, and uh, through the years, it's it saved our bacon a couple times. It gives it does give a, a fairly advanced uh, warning. Well, those are spinny rust, though, right? Yeah, they're they're, they're yeah. The, 
SSDs I fail different. Um, but smart should at least still help. Yeah. I don't it know should. why the monitoring failed. Um uh, we may never know. To be, yeah, I mean we'll never know for this particular instance. We'll just now now we know to uh to be a little more suspicious of it. So it sounds like we have lots more to talk about about this and but that we're it sounds like there's a good consensus and and we we've got a good direction and and I will test all that I can and and start using Choco Cat in anger again and I'm sure that you know in between my usual uh, the bugs that I insert in my work that if there's anything that looks weird then then we can maybe uh, maybe blame the the data loss but 99.99 percent is great and we really appreciate you and all the work that you did to make it come back to life.